I am beyond excited to be with Annie Duke here today. Uh, welcome, thank you, Annie, for giving us your time as we help uh, the group here discover how to make better decisions. Uh, so excited to be here with you today. So let's go ahead and get started just with a little bit of background. You were a world champion poker player and you've transitioned into helping organizations make better decisions. How'd you go from A to B? I actually started off my adult life as an academic. My specialty was in language acquisition, but you're studying uh, generally judgment and decision-making, learning, um, even things like color perception, taste, smell, those are all kind of going under this umbrella. Uh, this is very cross-disciplinary and thinking about how do we sort of make sense of the world. Because right at the end of graduate school, uh, with the full intention of going off to become a professor, I actually uh, was struggling with a stomach illness um, that landed me in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Very bad timing. At the time, I thought it was super bad luck. Um, because those uh, weeks that I was actually really sick were when I was supposed to go out to interview for all, you know, to become a professor. So I needed to take a year off. So in that year off, I discovered, oh no, I need money. So that was when I started playing poker. When I sat down at the table, it was just kind of a revelation. It was, I, I just loved it because it turned out I had a knack for this particular problem, which was, if you think about it, an amazing application of the kinds of things that I was studying in graduate school, which were specifically around learning when uh, basically learning in uncertain systems, when the feedback is quite noisy and there's like lots of luck involved and hidden information and, and whatnot. And if you think about poker, that's a really good expression of that particular problem with some pretty high stakes attached. And so I think I sort of took to it and really loved it. But my road to business consultant actually occurred about eight years into my poker career when I got asked, again, through a stroke of luck, um, by a hedge fund to come speak to their options traders. They wanted me to uh, talk to them about how the game of poker might inform the way that you think about risk. And that was a moment where really in an explicit way, I started thinking about this background that I had in cognitive science, judgment, decision-making, learning, and poker, and the way that those two disciplines could have this really interesting conversation with each other um, and inform each other. And I started somewhat accidentally sort of building a speaking career where I was going and speaking to businesses. And so for about 10 years, I overlapped poker with um, the speaking and consulting. And then in 2012, rolled out of poker. Um, and, you know, here I am. So Annie, if you're walking into a consulting session, what is going to be that one question that if you ask it, it's going to be that record scratch moment that gets everybody paying attention. Normally, it's 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 kind of like at this point, it's become a little bit of a magic trick. Question number one is, what's the best decision you made in the last year? And then question number two is, what's the worst decision that you've made in the last year? So this is something that I write about quite a bit. It's called resulting. It's an incredibly powerful illusion. Like if I run a red light and I get through safely, it doesn't make it a good decision. And if I have a car that's in perfectly good repair and I've looked both ways and I go through a green light and some jerk you know, comes the other way and runs a red light and hits me, it doesn't mean that I made a poor decision to proceed through a green light. So when we take a decision that's really simple, where the quality of the decision itself is quite transparent, it becomes easy for us to expose that resulting is a problem. Resulting simply being, I look at the result if it's good, I assume the decision is good. I look at the result if it's bad, I, I, I assume the decision is bad. And in fact, on Coda, I have a doc that's meant to help teams understand how much dispersion there is and, and what they th think that things mean. But here's the amazing thing. People don't agree on what always and never means. So. Some people think that always means like 95% of the time, like they're adding a fudge factor in. Whereas like someone like me, if I say always, I mean always, like it's 100% of the time. And same thing with never. Like some people think that never means 5% of the time. I happen to think it means zero. I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm saying I just think something different than other people. If we go to, for example, words to probability, notice that what I'm asking you to do there is to take words that have a pretty broad target range in terms of their meanings and to be precise about them, to say exactly what you mean. Um, and when you do that, what happens is that we expose the dispersion that lives on the team in terms of the way that you view these terms. And when you're trying to have productive team conversations, if we don't have a shared definition of what we're talking about, it's very difficult to actually have a productive conversation. Okay, so if my team has worked toward a better understanding of our shared terms, what else can we do to evaluate our decision-making? 
So another tool that we have on there is to help people do what's called a pre-mortem and a backcast. So we can think about in the Mona decision, getting other people's perspectives is one thing that we can do, but we can also think about getting uh, somewhere into the future and looking back on the decision, we also have a different perspective on the decision. And I hope people can sort of feel that intuitively. If you think about decisions you made 10 years ago, you think about them in a very different light and sort of with very fresh eyes compared to the way that you thought about it at the time. Uh, you can get that same advantage by uh, casting yourself into the future, imagining that you already know the outcome, and then thinking about why that might have happened. So let's say that you have some product that um, you think you can ship in four weeks. And the way this would go is uh, a backcast would be the positive version to say, uh, we exceeded our timeline uh, in a good way. In other words, we shipped it before four weeks was up. It was amazing. No bugs, smooth sailing. Why do we think that happened? Um, and then a pre-mortem would be to think about the downside, right? We had projected that it would take four weeks to ship. It's now 12 weeks later. We haven't shipped the product. What, what happened? What went wrong? And what this allows you to do is be able to essentially see what the risks are, what has to go well, what, what the risks are in, in the project or in the decision that you're, you're making. And then now, instead of reacting to those things when they happen, you can now foresee that they're going to occur. And you can start to put things in place that would help you to actually prevent those things from occurring. So that might, for example, be um, changing your timeline, just realizing four, four weeks is way too ambitious. That might be one thing that you might discover. Or you might just discover that certain things need to come together in terms of people's actions. And you can do things in order to reinforce and check in and make sure that those things are occurring. And the knowledge tracker, is that pretty much exactly what it sounds like? One of the things that we really want to do is make sure that we understand what was our state of knowledge at the time of the decision. Now, if you're doing this after a decision and an outcome has already occurred, a knowledge tracker is going to help you to uh, reconstruct the state of knowledge that you had at the time. And this is actually something that's quite hard to do in retrospect because of something called hindsight bias, which is this sort of feeling of like knew it all along, which I'm sure you've had people say to you before, right? Like, oh, I no, I knew that. I told you that. And you're thinking, no, you didn't. You didn't tell me that. What did we know before we made the decision? And what was the information that revealed itself after the fact so that we don't mix those two things together? So we're trying to get to is more and more creating a record of the knowledge that we have that's it being inputted into the decision at the time that we're making the decision so that we have to reconstruct less and less. So let's imagine that our team's gone through a lot of these exercises. We've done some knowledge tracking, we've done pre-mortems, we've some, done some bat casting. Now, how do we really facilitate that conversation to go into next steps, to convert that into action? The way that we want to elicit feedback is in a way that's precise enough that I can see where we differ because that's where all the amazing stuff is. Where we agree, it's like, okay, yay, we agree. But that's not where the really fertile ground for improving decisions is. Otherwise, um, if we just agreed about everything and that's what we talked about, we would have a team of one. What would be the point, right? Then when you go in to have the discussion, having elicited all of that asynchronously and independently so that people aren't we're not discovering that information. Put that into a doc, allow everybody to sort of see what the opinion is so that you're able to digest what uh, the decision space looks like before you get in. Notice this is very efficient. It's a big time saver, right? People initially hear, oh, this is gonna seem like a lot more work, but it saves you so much time in meetings that you will love this, I promise. So notice that what we're doing here is we're just doing information discovery. In other words, we're going through the lens of convey versus convince. The idea is for me to be able to convey to you why I believe what I do without the idea that I'm supposed to try to convince you of my point of view or you're trying to convince me um, of your point of view. So partly digesting the information in advance stops a lot of that contention where people feel like they have to fight for space to get their point of view out because it's already happened in advance. Now, one of the keys here is that there should be no expectation that we're going to come to agreement. I say what I want to say. You say what you want to say. If I happen to have changed my mind, I can say that. If I haven't changed my mind, that is totally fine. That's why you have a team. So that's really the key to great conversations is elicit the feedback in a way that's precise enough to be able to see the dispersion 
acknowledge agreement, but then focus on the dispersion in a way where you're trying to convey the information and not convince other people of it. I have to ask, do I have to use this framework for every decision? One of the things that that I really want to get across is that the kind of robust process that I'm talking about, which should be a, a ritual of teams, right? Um, you would only do for a decision that is uh, very hard to reverse and high impact. And when you're hiring a C-level executive, I hope that you want to slow down. When you're setting a remote work policy, I hope that you're slowing down or an internal mobility process. When you're doing follow-on decisions, these are things that should be slowed down. So we want to incorporate that as a ritual. But the, but the interesting thing is you can take little pieces of this and incorporate that as sort of rituals in your team discussions. So here's thing number one, particularly for leadership. When you're trying to get people's opinion, do not offer your opinion first. So when you're saying, okay, we have option A and option B, don't then follow it with, I prefer option B and here's why. Just describe option A and option B and get that opinion from your team. And this is very hard to do because we think that the option that, that we prefer is actually really important data for the team. I know I do. Um, so I have to stop myself from doing it because then I put you in the ugly position of having to disagree with me if you have a different opinion, which is quite uncomfortable for people. Before we head to the Q&A, Annie, any final takeaways for our audience? Yeah, so, you know, I created this toolkit because of the work that I do with my clients that what I'm trying to do is get them to be able to actually understand what did I know at the time so that you can go back and audit it and start to get really clean feedback loops, right? So this is what I knew at the time. These were the forecasts. This is how long I thought it was going to take to ship this product. Um, and as I look across all of those forecasts and then I see how long it actually takes me, now you can actually start doing an auditing process, not for the point of like finger pointing, but for the point of improving your decision making going forward. We want to be doing uh, information sharing, particularly uh, exposing places where there's dispersion of opinion and then allowing people to share their rationales for why they believe what they do. And the thing that we're really trying to do, interestingly enough, is get teams on the same page. Now, that doesn't mean that I think that teams are supposed to agree with each other. Not at all. What I mean by the same page is that I understand what you believe to be true and you understand what I believe to be true. And isn't it amazing that we all have different perspectives because in the end, that's going to improve our decision making. And that's really what this toolkit is meant to help people who aren't personally my clients be able to do. All right. Thank you so much, Annie, for your time and your insights. I know I'm looking at the decisions I make every day in a little bit of a different light, and my mind is opened up. Uh, we are going to be transitioning to Q&A, but I just wanted to thank you so much again for your time and helping us all become better decision makers today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited for the Q&A. Oh my goodness, Annie, thank you so much again for letting me fangirl in my interview with you. It's always a pleasure and I've been looking forward to today uh, for a long time. So the first question that we have from our audience is for the pre-mortems or trying to cast yourself forward into decision-making, how do you account for those unknown unknowns? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the answer is, uh, no matter how you're framing a decision, there are always going to be unknown unknowns. Um, but the way that I think about it is there's two things that are going to influence uh, the quality of your decision or the outcome of your decision. One is going to be luck, which you have no control over. Uh, and one is the quality of your knowledge. In other words, how well do you see the space of things that you don't know? Um, and by doing this in an intentional way, a pre-mortem, eliciting the feedback asynchronously and independently, so you're getting the best view of the different perspectives on the team, you're going to reduce the number of unknown unknowns that you have in the process. And that reduction is going to make a really big difference over time. So with all of this, it's, you know, you're not trying to get perfect. Uh, you're trying to get a little bit better at it. And that little bit better, like compounds, like interest in a bank account. Uh, in a really big way. So the more perspectives that you can get independently on a decision um, and what the premortem does is it allows you to get a different perspective for yourself as well, the more things you're going to capture in terms of the things that you might want to be thinking about that go into the decision. 
Got it. So I can't know everything. Dang no. it. Oh. Darn. We're not omniscient. We don't have time machines. That's what we're trying uh, to go for. Well, I hear that Nick Meta actually might be working on that from Gainsight. So we'll find okay, out. Okay, good. But uh, our next question uh, from the audience is, do you have any recommendations for what teams can do to make sure that they're aligned about how they perceive decisions and the differing perceptions? Well, so th I'm, I'm going to try to interpret. Th there's different ways that I could interpret this mm -hmm. question. So, um, so essentially, I think that you need to lose the idea that they need to be aligned. I, I think this is actually really important. What we know is that the best teams have a lot of cognitive diversity on them. That what that means is that people have very different perspectives, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes those perspectives on a decision aren't going to align, and that's okay. Um, you can have very different ideas. For example, like different people might have different facts available to them. Uh, different people might model those facts differently so that they're going to be thinking about those facts in a different way. Uh, two people could actually model the facts identically and still think that the decision you should make is different. And that's going to depend on things like risk tolerance, for example, or uh, your bankroll, right? How much, how much, uh, how many resources do you have to dump into the decision, for example, and that those can change those can, or where do you think the priorities are for where you should put the resources? Um, and people will just have a different idea about those things. And that's all okay. As long as you explore those different perspectives and you should elicit those different perspectives all along the way, whether it's everybody write a job description and say what the internal and external challenges are that the person's going to face and how would you describe them to a recruiter so you can capture all the different perspectives and people may not be perfectly aligned um, on who's supposed to, what type of person is supposed to fill those roles, but the different perspectives will be included in the process and that's going to make it better. I remember once I was working with um, someone, a, a team who was trying to hire a partner, an investment partner, and one of the person really cared, people really cared about like the touchy feely, like, are they kind? And the other one was like, they can be Genghis Khan as long as they're good at Vester. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but that was kind of what it was. And they started trying to convince each other to get aligned. And I said, stop. This is both of these perspectives will be included in the ultimate hiring rubric. And ultimately, that's going to mean that you hire a better person. Nice. Uh, the next question we have is about uh, smaller companies. So this person's asking, what is the biggest mistake that a small company can make when it comes to decision making? Oh, gosh, there's so many ways that this could go. <laughs> we um, messed up so many ways. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm going to look at both sides of the equation, right? So uh, enterprises, the biggest mistake they make is that they layer on too much approval process which means that everything has to be consensus. And uh, you end up with these like very sort of, um, in game theory, we would call it mini max decisions, meaning you're trying to minimize your maximum loss so you don't get in trouble, which means that you're trying to stick to status quo. So that's on the enterprise side. On the smaller company or like the startup you know, side, which is sort of how I'm interpreting small company here, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's move fast and break things. And then there's, move fast in the sense that you only ever use your intuition and you never stop and think for a second. So that's something that I see. They're just like, well, we're just doing stuff. And it's like, okay, but you still have to take a moment to sort of think about the broad picture and sort the decisions into really important versus this is something that we can really break. And do we want to break this, right? Is this a place where we can move fast? What is our reversal plan? Are we going to be willing to, you know, to quit? Um, how many resources are we going to put into this path before we abandon? What is the information that we're planning to find out from this? And just taking a moment to step back and think about those broader things in an intentional way allows you to really start to iterate and go fast. So I think it's those two things. One is like nothing can ever be done fast in an enterprise and everything is done fast, right? But it still matters. Like, who are you bringing in as leadership? You should take some time with that. And I see so many small companies be like, you know, someone recommended somebody, you know, and now we're going to marry them. And I'm like, I don't think you marry someone off of like one date and a recommendation, like have a process for, you know, decisions that really matter to the company. I love that. And, you know, I hadn't even thought about sort of the different flavors of fast, of the moving fast. Yeah. And that really opened up something for me. Thank you, Annie. 
Uh, the next question, you know, we've been talking a lot about business, but the, our next person wants to hear about poker. So this person wants to know any fun stories from your poker days and do you still play? So, yeah, so I'll answer the second part first. I don't still play. I retired in 2012. I hardly have time for the stuff that I'm doing now. I have a new book, which uh, the manuscript is due in December. I know, exciting. Um, I happen to have uh, left after five years of my PhD program uh, and just happened not to defend my dissertation. That that work did get published. I just didn't defend it. So I'm actually buttoning up my PhD and I'm going to do that in the spring. So I've already done all the research and then I have clients and, you know, try to slip some tennis in and some children. I like to pay attention to my children occasionally. So, uh, so no, I do not play poker anymore. Um, here's kind of, I think, uh, the most, uh, I, I'll give you a very fun story from my poker days. Um, I'm trying to think cause there's a lot, but th I think this is a really good one. So when I first started playing, um, I sort of had worked my way up to games where, you might have like maybe like three to five thousand dollars at risk in a particular game. So that was kind of the biggest game that I'd ever played in. So my brother called me up one day and said, "There's a game, and there's this big fish in the game. And a fish in poker is not a nice thing to call somebody. It, it means yes, <laughs> they're the bad player. And uh, so you have to come down and play in this game. But this game was like a really big game." where you could have like $30,000 at risk. So I'm super like terrified, but I go in and play and I'm doing really well. And like, I mean, by really well, I mean like I'm winning like $40,000. Like this is the most I've ever won in my life in a poker game. Um, so uh, the thing about this particular fish was that a lot of fishers, fish are like jolly and fun and nice. This one was a particularly nasty human being. He's very nasty. So he's very unpleasant. But like we were all putting up with it because he was also really bad at poker. So the fish goes broke because they were very bad, you know, and they're, they were super nasty the whole time, but they go broke. And normally there's a courtesy that happens in poker where when the fish goes broke, you continue to play. So you allow them to like get up from the table and leave the casino. So they don't see that the game is immediately breaking up as soon as they leave. But this particular fish, remember, was very nasty. He was really a very unpleasant person. So, um, so my friend David Gray, who is like somewhat short, balding, and like overweight, which is you have to understand that this is for the next part of the story. Um, the fish goes broke, and David Gray literally picks up his ante and puts it in his back in his stack and says, "Well, I guess the game's done." With the with the guy at the table. At which point the guy lunges across the table at David Gray and they they're, they're now rolling around on the casino floor. But remember, this is the biggest game that I've ever played in and they've lunged across the table and I have like 40,000 that I'm winning on the table. And I just take my hands like this and go lay myself on top of my chips because I'm like, I don't want them to spray all over the casino. So I'm just hiding like this around my chips. So then the security guards come in and they see these two people, this, you know, the fish and this, you know, rotund human being like rolling around on the floor. And normally both people would get barred from the casino. But the, this fish had a prior rep, <laughs> rep. So the security guard just came in and looked at the fish and said, you're barred. And then let David Gray sit back down at the table. So what I'm hearing is you have priorities and the decision was made. The luck is against me in these people getting <laughs> chips all over the place. So I'm going to make this decision. Yes, I just went, ah, like this while they were rolling around on the table. Uh, the next question we have from the audience is a little bit of a blend of uh, poker and corporate. So how did you play poker differently when you started trying to make better decisions? Did you notice your play, um, play changing? Yeah, so this is a little chicken and egg because mm. I did five years worth of PhD work in cognitive science before I started playing poker. So I think that what changed for me was I was bringing the cognitive science into the poker that I was playing for about eight years. And then eight years in, I got asked actually by a hedge fund to come speak to their options traders about how poker might um, inform your thinking about risk. And that was the first time that I really thought explicitly about the conversation that you could have, you know, cognitive science and poker could have. 
And I think that's the moment that there were some changes to my play because I started to really recognize in this very explicit way, the way that, uh, you know, the effect of being under such uncertainty in terms of how that was going to make you process, like, why did I win or why did I lose? And that then started to get me to think really clearly about when I win, I have to be thinking really in a laser focused way about the mistakes that I made, which is not the human tendency. And when I lost, I also needed to be thinking about the mistakes I made instead of blaming luck. And then the other thing that I really changed after I started having this explicit conversation with people was I stopped telling people the whole hand when I was asking their opinion about a particular move that I made. So instead of saying, you know, they raised the knight ace queen and then I raised and then they raised back and then the board came blah, blah, blah. And I did this and blah, blah, all the way till the end. I would just say this person raised and I would give some details about the person, you know, this person raised I had ace queen. What do you think I should do? And I just changed that little thing about the way that I talk to people. And I think that that was incredibly helpful. And you heard obviously in our conversation that that's something that I've really brought into. Um, and I like, how do you interact with people in order to improve decision-making? Cause I think it made a big difference. Yeah. That idea of uh, what can we do with the information that's given to us? Yeah. Uh, the next question we have is how can companies better empower team leads and managers to own decision making so there doesn't become a bottleneck up at the top? Yeah. So this kind of goes back a little bit to um, what, what does fast mean and what does slow mean? So uh, what needs to happen is that you have to have a real understanding. You have to think uh, in terms of a mental model of is this a decision that deserves like a robust process with a lot of eyes on it? And the more robust the process needs to be, the more eyes you need on it. But it's very rare that you're going to have something that's that big. So the way you think about it is if we get this wrong, what is the long term impact of the decision? That's question number one. Uh, and, you know, like in agile, you, you try to actually purposely make that small, right? Because you're you're doing like a test out to like a handful of customers, for example, if you're thinking fast. But um, and then the second thing is how reversible is it? Can we undo this? So if a CEO is hiring a direct report like the COO or CFO or something like that, um, there should be lots of layers there, because if you get that wrong, that has a really, really big and long term effect on the company. And it's very, very hard to undo. So but, you know, for most decisions you can start to take layers off because you realize like, well, it's pretty reversible. It's not going to actually affect the whole company. It may affect this team, but we have a plan in advance about what we would do in reverse and so on and so forth. So you have to start thinking just about what's the impact and how reversible is the decision. And then that can start to peel back approval process that can get you to actually go faster. I love that. And we have someone saying they love all the techniques. Are there any great examples that you can share on decisions you've helped teams with that were particularly memorable? Oh, gosh. Yeah. So I'll give you one um, from a sales funnel. So uh, I think sales funnel management is really, really tough because there's certain things where you're hiring for grit, like these people like will hold on to something and never let go. And I think that's true of sellers. Um, but what that means is that when you're looking at the funnel, you're losing a lot of expected value because the teams are not necessarily spending their time on the highest value opportunities. They're just spending as the maximum amount of time on each opportunity that comes into the funnel. So you're sort of trying to solve for that, but it's very hard for them to let it go. And then of course, when they do let it go, then you have like some review where you're like, why did you lose that? And it's framed that way. So what we did was we just sent out uh, two really simple questions to all the sellers, which was imagine you got an RFP or RFI. Um, you pursued the opportunity at six months later, it's closed, lost. Um, looking back, you realize there were early signals that that was going to be the case. What are those? And then we just had a second question, which was you, you source the lead yourself. And then we asked the same thing. And it was amazing. We had them all answer async and independently. And we got amazing answers like, uh, uh, the, the lead went to price first, or we couldn't get a techno, uh, technologist in the room, or we couldn't get an executive in the room. The RFP was written with a competitor in mind, and that was really clear. Um, and so we got all these great answers. And then what came out of that was a whole set of kill criteria, which is if you see this, either you kill it or you have to go ask another question. 
So in the case of like, uh, you can't get an executive in the room, uh, there would be an action that would follow, which is offer up executive alignment. And then if you couldn't get executive alignment by the next meeting, then you would kill it. And it allowed people to own that idea that you ought to be clearing things out of your funnel to have a very clear choice architecture that went into that. And that created a much more efficient, efficient management process that made it easier for people to quit the opportunities that weren't the best where they should have been spending their time on other things. And I think that was incredibly high impact and a super fun exercise. We put them into breakout groups to discuss them and figure out what would the next step be. So on, so on. So it was really fun. Amazing. And, and helping those, uh, the critical people use their most precious resource, their time yeah. to the max. That's well, exactly. unfortunately we have to close out this conversation, even close though I can talk to you all day long. So thank you so much, Annie. Um, and again, folks here uh, with us, you can find all of the details about Annie's fascinating work and the work of all of our speakers and panelists today, right there in your event doc. So check that out.